2007, we are on the corner of Miami and Hill in Wabash, Indiana at the Presbyterian Church. My name is Ashley Lichtenbarger and the camera woman is Megan Frick. Today we are interviewing John Gilpin um, for the Wabash County Historical Museum. John, what branch of the service did you serve in? Uh, the Army. Okay. And during what war did you serve? Uh, Vietnam. Okay. What was the highest rank that you um, achieved? Captain. Where, where in Vietnam did you serve? Uh, maybe in the Mekong Delta. Pretty much everything from Saigon southward. Okay. And were you drafted or did you enlist in the military? Uh, I enlisted. I um, had just graduated from veterinary school in 1966 and um, was right at the height of the Vietnam War and my roommate and I uh, both was planning on practicing small animal medicine and single, we were sure we were going to be drafted, so we went ahead and um, joined up um, to get the military out of the, out of the way. And uh, I didn't really get called into duty, though, until about a year after graduation. We went out to California and practice, he and I. For, he went in about six months earlier than I did, and then mm -hmm. I went into the Army. And we both eventually ended up in Vietnam. Okay. Um, why did you choose to go into the Army? Um, I, I don't know. I Probably because uh, there wasn't any veterinary corps. That was the main big veterinary corps in the military. Um, the Navy didn't have one and the Air Force was kind of dwindling down there. And I, during college I had served uh, in the Army ROTC as well. So. Okay, and what is a Veterinary Corps? The Veterinary Corps, um, well, this is there's different duties that they do. Of course, they take care of the animals, uh, scout and sector dogs, and they do much of the food inspection with the military as well. Um, they do some uh, research work, uh, medical hospitals and stuff like that too. Okay. All right. So as a veterinary, it makes you more able to do the jobs of medical things and things like that, as far as science and things. Right, right. Okay. The medical people at that time, veterinarians, um, doctors and, I mean, the physicians and the dentists all went in the military as captains. And at the time I went in, uh, just before that, the veterinarians who went into the military went in as first lieutenants, so our class is about the first ones to go in as captains okay. at that time. All right. Uh, do you remember the first days of your service? First days of my service well, it was involved training and so mm -hmm. forth. And how did that go? How was training for you? Um, it was interesting. It was, um, uh, we first went down to uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. This was in August, very hot humid <laughs> and uh, that was the uh, uh, where all the doctors and the nurses and medical people trained down there as far as military protocol and this type of thing and we did do some rifle shooting and stuff like this and uh, same thing as something regular soldiers do as well uh, that was for about one month uh, and then they from there they sent us up to Chicago and well, those are strictly the veterinary schools up there in Chicago, and uh, that's where we learned uh, meat inspection and food inspection up in that area. And then from there, then they assigned us to a base. Okay. Do you remember your instructors from training? No. No? Nothing about them sticks out? Not particularly, huh? Okay. Um, where did you go in Vietnam first? Where did you come into? Do you remember? Um, well, it flew into, left from California, um, around San Francisco, and we flew into um, just north of Saigon there. Okay. Long Beyond, I think it was called. All right. And uh, what was it like when you arrived? What, do you remember your first impression? Um, Yeah, it was just very hot and humid, and um, um, 
really didn't know what to expect in a way, something like that. In our training, we had gone through some training about Vietnam, in case we were ever sent there and so forth, as far as some of the traps and so forth that the enemy might have set. But I had no idea what my duty was going to be once I flew there, until I got somebody picked me up at the um, base there and drove me down to the headquarters in Saigon, and then where I met my commander, and then, then they told me then what I was going to be assigned to. Okay. And what was your assignment? Um, I was taking over another veteran in the Mekong Delta there, um, and his tour was just ending, and, and so I was going to replace him. And his duty was he, and myself, was the only veterinarian in the whole Mekong Delta, um, south of Saigon. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the other um, people were a little bit north or right around the Saigon area in our unit. But my, I was just by myself, other than I had two enlisted veterinary technician men mm -hmm. I worked with, and some other veterinary technicians out in the uh, bases, um, like the Special Forces and other bases around Mekong Delta. Mm -hmm. But my office was in Canto, which is pretty much the center of the Mekong Delta on an Army Airfield um, base. And uh, most of the time I traveled by helicopter, airplane to check on my personnel, most of the personnel out in other areas and other bases, um, and to check on scout and sentry dogs and things like that. So I'd just catch a ride on a helicopter or fixed wing airplane that was carrying supplies or something just to get a ride. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you took care of all the animals around and you, you did all those things that you were, the meat inspection and the... Yeah, food inspection. Um, I, actually, much of my enlisted men did that and were trained in that area. And I just kind of oversaw them and uh, uh, kind of commanded them and, and um, made sure they were doing things right and there were no problems or anything like that, which sometimes they were and sometimes they weren't. <laughs> okay. Um, did your area see any combat as a... Yes, yeah. Now yeah, you're always worried about that. Unfortunately, I uh, didn't have any problems and got out of there okay. Um, our unit, while I was there, a veterinarian and a technician were the first ones to get killed over there. But that was just a, uh, a little bit north of Saigon area. And, uh, so you never knew that he went down. We traveled by jeep a lot, if we didn't fly, particularly if it was on the roads not too far away, and pretty secure. Well, he took a uh, route that kind of warned him not to on something like that, kind of a shortcut, and hit a landmine. You just have to be careful yep. about those things. Okay, um, were there many casualties of the men that you were overseeing? No, not my men personally. Okay. What are some of the most memorable experiences that you have of your military experience? Oh, again, probably Vietnam. Um, probably changed my life completely on something like that. The, the, um, the people in medical corps, my office was right in Canto, was uh, right next to the airfield dispensary. Mine was a kind of wooden building and uh, that the predecessor before I had built and really had flower boxes and a carport and everything like this that, for his Jeep and so we had to build a nice place there. Uh, considering the conditions, next door was, theirs was a big uh, concrete building where the doctors and the dentists were and, and we had a close relationship there. We'd uh, get together again and have some parties and remember things like that and uh, other things we shouldn't do. Uh, I don't know whether you ever saw the movie MASH, but that's very, the medical court is very much like that. And uh, we want to have parties. If you do favors for one person, they'll do a favor for you. And, and um, maybe I'd go over to the class one yard where, where they keep the foods. Can have a nice case of steaks and we have a cookout or something like that. And, <laughs> Sounds good. And, uh, but the medical corps is so different than any other branch of the Army or military. Again, it's a lot like the MASH 
movie and television show. That uh, there's a lot of smart people there, and we don't worry that much about the military protocol. I don't care whether you, you salute me or anything like that. Just obey my orders as far as my men and many of the the enlisted men are just as smart as the, the officers. Many of them maybe master's degrees and PhD. And we we have hang around unless the officers do their thing and enlisted men do another thing. And, we had a lot of fun together on something like that. I, was, I always told my men, I said, you know, I don't care about a lot of things, but just do your job and do it well and stay out of trouble and keep me out of trouble. And they did. They did very good that way. There was a mutual respect? Then. Pardon? A mutual res respect? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, two enlisted men that I had um, with me right there at Canto all the time. Uh, they did much of the food inspection around the, the, the base there and the class one yards and make sure the refrigeration equipment's not breaking down and the food spoiling and so forth. Um, that at that time in the back of my building was preventive medicine uh, and their enlisted men, which is another branch of the medical corps. My men didn't get along with their enlisted men too well. And I got tired of hearing about that. <laughs> And so I went over to the airfield commanders to see if I could get uh, a little building added on to mine, a separate room for them and so forth. They didn't live in a barracks with, me, with the regular soldiers or anything like that. And um, the day that I went over there, to, I really didn't have a good reason to do that, but um, <coughs> I went over to the airfield commander's office, and the airfield commander was not in it that day. He was away, and so there was an acting Air Force uh, Air uh, Commander there, and um, uh, some lieutenant colonel or something like that. And he was real busy, and so forth. And was, so I'm like a mash. I just come up to him and said, here, uh, I need you to sign this. So he signed the form to go ahead and build this building next to mine. I don't think he even knows what he was signing at that time. <laughs> So it was kind of like that, you know? Yeah. Okay. And many, many friendships. We had a lot of friendships with the, uh, the doctors, particularly next door and the dentists. We were pretty close. And, and the doctors I was closest with was a Cardinal fan, and uh, seeing those Cardinal fan, it was right during the World Series, too, and I was a Detroit Tiger fan, and <coughs> the Tigers hadn't been in a series in eons. So we had a little bet going there, and we listened to the, the games on it. The World Series games played then were in the daytime, and um, we could get it live on Armed Forces Radio. <laughs> but the games didn't start till like one o'clock in the morning, and we stayed up, listened to the whole ball games, you know, all <laughs> night long. That was that was that was a good time, good memories. Good. Did you keep up any of those friendships after? No, I unfortunately never saw them before. Skip Freeman, Dr. Freeman was this, that guy I was talking about there. He's a good friend. And um, I don't know, I just never, never saw those people again. And even in my own veterinary unit, I never saw them again. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the man that you went to veterinary school with and then enlisted with? Did you ever? Yeah, he's, well, yeah, he was a classmate, and, and um, I've seen him a few times. Mm -hmm. um, after he came back uh, and got out of the Army, uh, he was in Highland Animal Hospital in, in Highland, Indiana for a little while there. And I was kind of practiced six months in Chicago when I came home and then went back to California and for one year and didn't like it as well. And so I came back to the Midwest and I, then he left and I took his job at the, in Highland, Indiana. Mm -hmm. and worked there for about 15 years. And he, t he left, when he left Highland, he went out to um, Portland, Oregon. He's still there in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Okay. I practice there. Okay. But I see him occasionally. He would write occasionally. Right. Um, you said you were awarded the Bronze Star. What was that for? Um, just for a meritorious service in, in a hostile zone there. No, no, not just to classifications, not for any brave thing I did or anything other than, you know, like saving any soldiers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
since you were overseeing the people who were in charge of the some of the supplies, some of the food, did you have plenty of supply? Oh yeah, food was very good. Yeah, it was good. Um, when I first six months, I was as I when I went to Vietnam, I was in as I say they only got in the Mekong Delta, and then they transferred me back to headquarters in Saigon. <laughs> so my last six months were in Saigon, which I didn't like as well. And my duties up there were uh, sanitary inspections, and uh, around Saigon and the Greater Saigon area, I had to inspect uh, places that the <coughs> Vietnam Vietnamese ran, uh, where we would buy food from them, like ice plants and bakeries and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Even inspect some of the, the soda plants and so forth, which often those were run and operated by the French people who were there before, so there were quite a few French still there. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of interaction with the Vietnamese yes. at that time and the French? Yeah, I did, and, and even in the Mekong Delta, that was another most, one of the more interesting things. Um, besides my s food inspections and my uh, scout and sentry dog work, well, we, I also had a Mekong Delta, a, a nice little veterinary clinic I set up there. And, um, you know, the, the GIs would pick up pets all the time and monkeys and snakes and stray dogs and uh, I had to take care of those and vaccinate animals and so forth like that. And uh, uh, another part of my duties were what we call civic action. That was probably the most interesting. Um, that's why I worked with the Vietnamese people, particularly the, uh, with their farm animals, um, the water buffalo and the and the um, cattle used there, there was a Brahma cattle, which were kind of thin cattle, and uh, uh, kind of the sway back pigs and hogs and stuff like that. And we usually worked with, there really weren't many, or hardly any Vietnamese veterinarians. So <coughs> the military veterinarians kind of took care of, helped, tried to help take care of the local population there, along with agricultural people on the civilian sides what they called cords or um, you say or something like this is people were not in the military but Americans there specializing in like agriculture and, and they often ask us to us army vets to help out and something like that. Mm -hmm. They did have one thing when I was there um, outbreak and disease called hemorrhagic septicemia in their cattle and water buffalo and so uh, Captain Rocky, another veterinarian in our unit, but farther north, he and me and his enlisted men, and he um, went out to vaccinate uh, some of these uh, water buffalo and cattle, and um, mostly along the Mekong or well, uh, along the Cambodian border, and um, um, that was something kind of scary. And I, at the time I did it, I didn't think. That much about it, but afterwards I said, "Boy, we really took a big risk there, and I don't think I would ever have done it again." But um, that was quite interesting. We would go to—it um, was all kind of planned ahead of time, but they knew where we were going to go. We, we started a special forces or Green Break camp there along the border. That was where we stayed overnight most of the time, and we got in the, our, then we traveled down these long, straight canals, it was, and uh, with a, just a little outboard motor and a rowboat type thing to go to the next village or hamlet and then they would build a supposedly build a corral or some sort of a shoot, what we call a chute to bring these cattle and buffalo in so we could vaccinate them and we tried to get people to do that uh, as the next few days and they got worse and worse as, as the days went along and something like that. Uh, we had as far as guards, we just had what we called Chu Hoys, which were former Viet Cong that supposedly were on our side. But uh, we could have been ambushed so easily there and something like that. It was really dangerous what we did, but we did try to help the people out. I had trouble diagnosing at first what the disease was because those people, when they, an animal died, like the water buffalo or anything like that, they cut it up real fast. And, use every bit they can so we didn't have anything really for a while didn't have anything to do autopsies on so <coughs> very difficult but 
we finally found out what it was and we were able to get some vaccine to go out and do that. But that was that was one of the most interesting things there. And and we the, the, the village chiefs would usually invite us in for lunch or something in their little huts and so forth. And of course you always accept. And, but you go in there and you of course, there's pig stuff, the dirt floors, and pigs walking around underneath the table, and um, the um, there'd be a meal there or something with some potatoes and, and chicken, but the head and the feet and everything else are in the <laughs> pot, and <you'd, laughs> some of that stuff you, you didn't want to turn them down. But. So you had good relationship with the, the native. Oh people. yeah. Mm -hmm. You never know, really knew who was what, though. I mean, it's sort of like Iraq now. You know, they still know who's. They seem like friends, but you never know on something like that. The enemy many times didn't wear any uniforms, or mm -hmm. and so you worried. And the kids are kids, but you know, street urchins uh, sometimes are out around all over the place, and you got to be a little afraid of them. Mm -hmm. Story I remember when I was in Saigon, and I think I went to this bottling plant with my interpreter, Miss On. And she goes, went with me, and we went in there. And the Jeeps, um, there's no ignition key or anything like that. And uh, uh, so keep them, and Jeeps are stolen all the time, uh, just like in the MASH movie. But um, to keep them from getting stolen, we had a big chain that went around the steering wheel with a padlock. And so when we ever went into something and left our Jeep, we locked it up. I came out after doing this one inspection, I said, oh no. I said, and because somebody put a different lock on there, on my <laughs> steering wheel. And, and the kids are all around all the time. And they would laugh and laugh. And I said, what am I gonna do here now? And a little kid comes up there, which I never even thought of, just gives the steering wheel a great yank like this and it popped that lock. I never thought of that. You know? <laughs> He's probably the one to put it on there. And you had to watch all the time when you're out with these little kids because they, they would pick your pocket. I mean, just hanging around you and somebody would be in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, when you had downtime, what did you do for entertainment? Um, listen to music when I was over there. It's an opportunity to really get some nice, uh, at that time, very modern tape equipment, uh, audio tape, and stereo sets. The Japanese usually brands were the best at that time, and you get them relatively much, much less, you know, expensive over there in the PXs and so forth. And so they got stereo equipment and then listened to music that way and um, camera equipment brand new cameras, Japanese cameras at that time, and, uh, with all the different lenses, and um, take pictures. You, you write a lot. I always look forward to the mail, like, like sure soldiers do today on something like that, or any packages from home. And, um, hang out with friends, like we say most of them are in the medical field, other doctors and dentists and so forth. And, and then the officers' club. We go to the officers' club. Mm -hmm. We always do that. Okay. Did you get very many special packages from home? Not a few, not too many. Again, around birthdays or Christmases and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, somebody would make some cookies or something, send them and so forth. I look forward to the letters and the conversations and the one thing we did, my family did do is um, I just had a little tape recorder type thing and with the little tapes and, and uh, uh, I instead of writing sometimes I we talk and I'm just talking to the machine and then mail that to them and they could just hear my voices and mm -hmm. stuff like that and, th and then they they'd send it back and, and, but then, you know they record their voices and say some things to me so forth. I think my grandma might, my mom might have saved some of those. I don't. See, that was the thing. It was, I feel sorry about because some of those. Um, when they sounded to me, I would just erase what they said and and and, and then 
but what I wanted to say on, on the same tape and send it back to him, but I wish I hadn't have done that now, so mm -hmm. keep that as a record you know, of what we said to each other. Did you get any opportunity to travel while you were in Vietnam? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in one year time over there, you get um, a week of R&R, &R, what they call R&R, &R, and then a week of leave. And uh, I took uh, one of those. I didn't do it till I was about the last three months or so in Vietnam. I hadn't used any that time up. And I uh, went to Hong Kong for a week, and then I went to um, Australia for a week. Many of the soldiers, particularly those that are married, would go to Hawaii and um, um, meet their wives and so forth there. Mm. But since I was single, I, I just wanted to see other parts of the world, so I went to Australia and then Hong Kong. Do you have any memorabilia from those trips? Did you? Yeah. Um, do you remember anything particularly humorous or unusual that happened? Mm -hmm. yeah, other than what I told you there, nothing. I probably are, but I can't think right at the moment. I don't think um, unusual there. there when I came home that was kind of different in a way uh, I as I said before before I went into the military I, my roommate and I were in Cal Southern California around Los Angeles and and so I knew some people there and since we, when we flew back home again first landed in California and uh, instead of flying right back to the, my home in the Midwest, my family's in South Bend, I still is, um, I decided to see a friend, uh, one of my girlfriends, just girl love, but um, actually she was my roommate's girlfriend. Uh, and, um, but I wanted to, to see her and so forth, and we were good friends, and so I, Rented a car and drove from San Francisco area down to Los Angeles to see her, her for a couple of days before I flew home since I was right in the same state. And, uh, so we, had, we went out to dinner and then we went to a movie and of all movies was uh, the MASH movie which had just come out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I really didn't know anything about it, you know, and, but I just love that movie. I mean, it's amazing because so they just came from a war zone. Now that's the Korean War and this is Vietnam, but there were so many similarities between uh, the medical units at the same time. But you know that those different time periods and something like that. And I just love that movie. I said, I just laughed. And I was like, boy, this is so true. To even today on something like that. But that's the way the medical unit is. I mean, they're they're good and they work hard and. Uh, Forget all the military protocol, and, and they do their jobs right. And it's just you know, it's just exactly what the true picture of it was. I was glad that they portrayed it that way in the movie. So, since you're a fan of Mash, and you know that one guy who does crazy things, does some people do funny things to try to get out of their service or to just make people laugh and entertain people? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't, no, I didn't see anything like the Jamie Farr character. Yeah. That's, the, that's the TV show. He wasn't really in the, that wasn't in the movie. But, yeah. But, um, yeah, I was, again, I showed uh, how the radar was in it, you know, and how you connive all the time to try to do favors for one person to another. If you help me out, I'll help you out. And mm -hmm. To start the movie by him stealing the jeep and so forth. That was very true. You know, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was great that way. Okay. Um, what did you think of? Um, 
I guess you already answered how you felt about your fellow soldiers and officers mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, I would say that, you know, I always had a sense of humor, but it's, it's a funny thing to say this, but we're talking about the mash and everything like that, and we had parties and there, and a lot of, we had a lot of fun in a way, and when, when you're not in bad situations and see bad things and so forth, and you really start joking around like they're doing, man, just horsing around and joking and pulling jokes. That's where I really, strangely enough, you know, developed a sense of humor. Otherwise, you'd go crazy if you didn't on something like that. So it's an important part of Right, you gotta, you gotta block out the bad and say, come on, man, you gotta <laughs> so people find something pranks. fun here to do, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so people pulled a lot of pranks on one another? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are some of those? Um, I can't think of anything specific there, but <laughs> some, again, some tragedy. This is one guy. Again, uh, there was drugs use over there, probably more marijuana than anything else, and, and a lot of depression. And we saw some, I saw some soldiers that phew, really, it was affecting them mentally so bad. Um, one listed man, and a medic over on, again, the dispensary next door, he shot himself, and that was a bad situation. But, Other times, it just, you just, this is part of what we were involved with, and I'm sure what they have nowadays, and you just got to keep going on on something like that. And while I was over there, I was all for the war mm -hmm. uh, to start off with, and I think the idea was right. But when I got over there and saw, <coughs> lived it, I could see the air was there, and this was 68 to 69, and this was the height of the buildup in the war, that it was just not going to work out. And we shouldn't have, should have been there and something like that. Mm -hmm. Not that the soldiers and everybody weren't doing a good job, but it was too political. And, and um, of course, they were bringing North Vietnamese and communists were bringing supplies down the um, what you been trail there along the Cambodian border, or across the Cambodian border, on, and we got newspapers and stuff like that, and got all the news, and we knew what was going on, and, and said you couldn't do this or couldn't do that, and I wanted to go over there across the border to help stem that tide of that disease. They said, no, you can't go across the Cambodian border. I guess I'm tired of that, you know. And I said, well, how can you win a war? I mean, you know, fight a war just in the boundaries here and something like that. If, mm -hmm. if war is war, you gotta. And uh, the people there are nice people. Vietnamese people are beautiful people. But again, I think it's the same way in, in Iraq now that there was no national unity there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There's a South Vietnamese government, which sometimes was a little shaky. And like any of those, there's corruption in, in any different levels of those governments. And, and, the, and the people, they, you know, they were really only concerned about them and themselves. There was no national pride or unity that way. Mm -hmm. And was, you got to have that to, to win on something like that. Otherwise, there's no way if the people aren't going to, you know, fight for their own country and own beliefs. But they didn't have that. Do you think that being there changed your opinion about war in the military in general? No. Or just that specific? No. Just that. But fight it. A war that, again, that's where I was against. I voted for Bush and all this, but I'm against. I was against him going in, us going into Iraq. Um, I said, oh, that's going to be another Vietnam. And nobody said anything about it. I could see there wasn't that unity there. Mm -hmm. They're they're all happy that when it all fell and the statue fell and all, we well, weren't in control. I said, uh -uh, we're not in control. <laughs> yeah. It's not over, and, and I just knew it was going to be that way. But I, you know, I, I <clears throat> our military is very good. The people are very brave, and they're they're. But I think we should really be careful about 
where we send our military and so forth here and really think it out clearly. And I think we should use our military more for our own borders and not all over the world. We concentrate more here in our own country rather than policing the world. So the mil I have nothing against the military. If anything, I'm very patriotic that way and, and uh, extremely so. If I'm because they don't have the draft anymore, but I, I, I personally think every young man, if they're physically fit, should serve at least two years in the military. And you learn a lot, it's good for everybody, I think. And it's a, only two years out of your life, and, and, um, and then go on with your career or whatever, or whatever you want to do, but I think it's important. I, <coughs> some countries, a lot of them do that. And, and, uh, I think it's think? a good idea. Why do you think it's so important for someone to go in for at least a couple of years? To, be, to go into the military? <clears throat> um, it just, it's, you learn so much. You really do. And, and uh, um, well, there's a chance you could get killed or something like this, but many times not. You're not in times of war and so forth. And, and it's good for your education. It's good for, to learn to, to how other people are and, and uh, learn how to take orders and how to give orders, how to have discipline, and, as well as all the educational benefits and, and meet all different kinds of people. And it's just a wonderful uh, education thing. Plus, you feel like you have a little more pride in your own country if you've done something like that. Um. Do you remember when you were done with your service and the situation surrounding that and what it was like for you? Um, well, I was glad to get home and be home safely and, and this is something when in any war zone you kind of know when you're going to be going home and um, there was just called when you're getting short, I don't know if you only got a month to go or something like that, and you're tour duty, and and you don't want anything to happen that last month. You, you, everybody used to talk about that over there. And you're getting short, and, and that final day that you that I left, and actually kind of rushed off to the airport quite quite early, you know, faster than I thought I was going. And my interpreter, Miss Han, had some gifts for me, I guess. And, she missed me. She went to lunch when I left. But other people had given me gifts and so forth. Vietnamese people who I left. And I always remember that. I still have some of those. Um, then going up to Long Bend, I guess it was, where the, most of the planes came in and out of. When they transported the soldiers back and forth, it was commercial jets that the military <coughs> hired. But I remember. Um, for some reason it was delaying taking off and we were in the jet and the air conditioning wasn't on, the engine wasn't on, it was hotter, it was like sitting in a tin can and that sun in Vietnam was beating down on you and you just wanted to get out of there, you know, you didn't always get, so get that big bird going so fly <laughs> home. So when it did take off, that was a big relief there and something like that, for sure. Um, and then I say then I went to California for a couple of days before I flew home and then flew back to South Bend with my family where I was happy to be home and so forth like that. I never saw so Vietnam better and said, you know, people were against them and afterwards and treated them badly. I never had that problem. Mm -hmm. Do you talk about the fact that you were a Vietnam veteran after that very much in your lifetime? No. Occasionally, but Usually, I don't know if anybody asks. I don't bring it up a lot. Not that I uh, and don't want to talk about it or anything like that. It's just, just talk about other things now. Mm -hmm. Unless it comes up, then I'll talk about it. Okay. Um, so, afterward, you were already done with school. Did you come? When did you come to Wabash? And well, I came to Wabash in 1985. At the Wabash Veterinary Hospital at that time. I just retired and sold the practice last year. 
and um, didn't get married until 1988, mm -hmm. and uh, so my wife was in Wabash with me. Okay, and you were you were a veterinarian until you retired. Mm -hmm. I was okay. in practice for 40 years, graduated in 66. Just small animals or? Yeah, in practice just small animals. I say I got knowledge, did some large animal. And um, of course, veterinary school, did some large animal work. But uh, I just mainly dogs and cats, small animal practice. How was it in Vietnam working on monkeys? Was that your first monkey? Um, yeah, I didn't <laughs> do too much there. One incident, which hurt badly. Um, my vet checks out in one of the out bases there, make on the other one. He had vaccinated some monkeys for rabies and, and, he, and he used modified live virus, we say, and uh, rather than a killed virus vaccine. And, uh, certain animals you can use the modified live virus, uh, not primates or monkeys. Because uh, that could give them the disease. I found out about that. Oh man! I said, "Boy, you, you got to get those monkeys in." I said, "We're gonna have to put them down. You can't take a chance." Getting mm -hmm. rabid and being pests with these G's, like GIs. Mm -hmm. I hate to do that, and I probably the GIs were happy about us euthanizing their monkeys, but we, we just couldn't take a chance on something like that. Yeah, it's too big. Because I, you should have known better. I hope you never made that mistake again. Mm -hmm. Um, after your return, did you join any organizations, veterans organizations? No. Um, I never was really asked that much. Um, for a little while, I, uh, the state VFW or something I belonged to, but I never, it was just through mail or something like that. But I, I was never really asked, so I never did. Do you think that um, your experience in war and in the military changed your life as far as afterward? If it's something that you said it, it made you have a sense of humor and things more, like yeah, that. So but take not life so seriously, don't take it so seriously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it told me, well, it, sure, it told me about well, just things, as I say, comparison to Vietnam and the war there, how different people are. And since then, I've, I've done a lot of traveling. Before I ever went in the military, in the very school, uh, I say my roommate and I went to California, which I've never been hardly out of Indiana mm -hmm. up to that time. And so that was a big adventure, going to Hollywood and Southern California area. And then in the military, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and then Vietnam, and then Hong Kong, and I, single and no family and, or children or anything like that. I, I, I traveled a lot after that and I, uh, many places around the world. And that's taught me a lot too. I had a love to travel, um, not to big resorts or something, but third world countries and, some, and um, different cultures than we have. And I like to study those things. And <coughs> extremely interesting. And, this teaches me much more about life, I think. Um, this is why we can't, I, I know we can't, you know, and, and shouldn't try to put all our American values on other countries. It's just, they are hundreds and hundreds of years. They have done things the way they are, whether they use kids for work and labor and they don't have any money and that's the way they've always done it and so forth. And, it just tells you about other cultures. I've learned a lot that way. Is that something you think you're going to continue exploring in your retirement? Oh, yeah. Um, as long as I'm healthy enough to travel. Uh, these long, long flights get to me after a while. In fact, just my wife and I just uh, took a trip to Tahiti in May. That's a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> One of the flights was eight and a half hours long. And Coming back, it was, the plane was delayed eight hours, so that was, <laughs> you're out for maybe 36 hours without any sleep, that's, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs>
but I love to travel and, and see other cultures and, and uh, other people. And do you think you would have done that if you hadn't gone to Vietnam? I, I might have probably. I was, I've always had that kind of adventure in my soul to do things like that. Traveling overseas and going to places like that when I went to Vietnam sparked it a little more probably. Okay. Sparked that desire. Okay. Um, is there anything else? Any other stories or anything that you think that I might mm. want to? Yeah, not right offhand there probably is at times, but I can't think of right specifics there now. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It.